Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text being the gospel, we especially hear these words of Thomas in the 25th verse of John 20. Unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails and place my finger into the mark of the nails and place my hand into his side, I will never believe. Here ends the reading of the text. Friends in our Lord Jesus Christ, just a word from the pastor's notebook before we jump into the sermon. And this comes from another part of our gospel reading. It's the part where Jesus says to the disciples, he breathes on them and says, receive the Holy Spirit. That we may recall, I've said to you many times, that the word for spirit, breath, and wind, both in the Hebrew and in the Greek, are the, the same word for all three in each language. And so the idea of his breathing upon them was to breathe his spirit upon them in their minds. We say, oh, he breathed his breath, and then he said, receive the spirit. How are they connected? Same word. When, they, when he did that symbolic thing, they understood exactly what he was doing. And then as he set them aside, he said, I'm sending you, and then did this as a sign of his sending that they went in his spirit, namely the Holy Spirit, with which Jesus and the Father are one. But then he says this, if you forgive the sins of any, they're forgiven. If you withhold forgiveness from anyone, it is withheld. Because this is sometimes hard, and our good, regular church folk can stumble on this, it is important when it comes up to use that time to say, when I stand up and give what is known as the holy absolution, where you confess your sins and I stand before you and say, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And you might say to yourself, uh, Pastor, I was confessing them to God, not to you. It's nice of you to forgive me. I was looking for God to forgive me. This verse completely changes this from being my words to being my uh, taking and appropriating Jesus' words. That he says to me, as one who would be in the legacy of the apostles by virtue of your call to me, that when I say, I forgive you, I am following what Jesus said to those early apostles, if you forgive the sins of anyone. And there seems to be in us a need to hear God himself saying, I forgive you. And when those words are said, we don't believe that Pastor Robertson decided whether to forgive us or not. He is being faithful to this confession and these words of Jesus and this calling. And you can be sure that as surely as you confess your sins, this is God forgiving you. Now, I did not die on a cross for you, and thus I am not the source of the forgiveness. I am what we call the immediate cause. A carpenter may have a saw and may saw a piece of wood. When the carpenter saws the wood, that's proper grammar. But we can also say the saw saws the wood. One is the source of the action. The other is the tool by which the action is done. When the words, I forgive you all your sins, are spoken according to Jesus' command, he remains and will always be the source of that forgiveness coming to you. I am a mere tool in the carpenter's hand. So much for the pastor's notebook. We launch into Thomas giving some pretty fierce and ornery words regarding the Lord having shown up without him. And we talk today about doubt. There is doubt all over the Bible, but there are certain places of doubt where we see it specifically. We see a number of places, and I can't cover them all, but glaring at us in Scripture is miraculous birth doubt. For instance, Sarah, Abraham's wife, is told she's going to have a child. She just laughs because she's past childbearing age. But that laugh did not seem to be a laugh in faith, and God was not amused. Zechariah, a high priest, or a priest serving in the position that uh, he would serve for the offering of the sacrifice that day, becomes John the Baptist's father. But what happens? Gabriel stops him while he's there to offer the sacrifice and says, you're going basically to be the father of John the Baptist. And Zechariah again says, you know, how, how is this going to happen? And again, God disapproves and shows that uh, by allowing the Zechariah, who just spoke those words of lack of faith, will not speak any words until it's time to name John uh, and the birth has already happened. By the same token, there's another kind of doubt which Abraham had shown when he was told he would be the father of many. When I read Abraham's uh, word, what he reacts and how Sarah reacts, I can't tell the difference. 
But the only way I know there is a difference is by how the Lord receives each of their responses. Abraham, we are told, believed God, and it was counted to him as righteousness. And then there's the Virgin Mary, who's minding her own business, and the angel Gabriel himself appears to her and tells her she's going to be the mother of our Lord. And when this happens, she says, how can this be since I have not known a man? And she is asking, it is a form of doubt, how can, how can this happen? But she is asking to know God's will further, and we see God's approval in this way. The angel Gabriel stops and he explains to her, the Holy Spirit will be upon you, and you will conceive in your womb, and that which is born will be uh, the, called the Son of God. And so she says, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be as you have spoken. And so we understand that there is doubt in various ways, some of which God works with and, other of, and seems to wish to discover more about God, and other of which God is not uh, approving. We look at another kind of doubt in Scripture, and I would point you to John the Baptist. John the Baptist preaches and he tells people to get ready for the Messiah to come. And all Judea, we're told, goes out. People from the nearby foreign countries are filtering in, possibly Jewish believers from there, but in whatever way, seeking repentance. And they're baptized in the Jordan. They're confessing their sins. Jesus comes. The amazing testimony that Jesus is God with the Holy Spirit present and the Father speaking. John is witness to all of these things. He points to two of his own, John's disciples, to Jesus says, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. Here John is assured that this is who Jesus is, and John keeps preaching the truth. And one day he preaches the truth to Herod and says, It's not right for you to be having your brother's wife in the way you are. And Herod's upset, and she probably got his ear and said, don't let him portray me like that in public. And so John gets thrown in jail. And John's ministry is abruptly, his public ministry is abruptly over. He's not out there preaching by the riverside anymore. But at the same time, what happens is we hear him sounding discouraged, and he sends his disciples. Now, some say John was doubting. Some say the disciples were, and John sent them on a mission so that Jesus could calm those doubts. But one way or the other, there's doubt over in that section of the kingdom. And so the disciples of John come to Jesus and they say these words, Are you the one who is to come, or should we look for another? And when they say that, what is happening is they are expressing, Did we do all this for nothing? Are we, is this what God had wanted us to do? And then Jesus offers a reassurance in the state of doubt. And he says, Go tell John what you see. The blind receive their sight. Uh, the uh, lame are made to walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, the dead are raised, and the poor have the good news preached to them. And they are reassured in their doubts. And so again, we look through the scripture and we see doubt as a kind of scoffing or unbelief, doubt as a way of wanting to know more about God, doubt in a way where it still seeks God and is really looking for reassurance. And so doubt in Scripture takes a number of forms and accomplishes another number of purposes. We love our Transfiguration uh, Reredos, our triptych painting here on the Reredos. And what happens is this. While Peter, James, and John are up there with Jesus, that if you do a little subtraction, you realize 12 minus 3, there's still nine disciples, and they're down on the plain. And they're busy ministering down there. They are. And meanwhile, Jesus is showing the glory of heaven as the disciples have never seen it. And uh, he's talking with Moses and Elijah, for goodness sake. And so it's time to come down from the mountain. When they come down from the mountain, do you know what they see? A giant commotion down there. And, it, and the disciples are at the middle of it. And a man comes over to Jesus and says, you know, my translation, you won't believe this. I brought my son to your uh, disciples to take care of uh, offering healing to cast out a demon. And they couldn't do it. And suddenly Jesus has to solve a problem. After all this glory, it's time to come back and be in chaos and do the problem solving. And uh, so he says to the man who describes what's happening, he says, all things are possible. This is Mark recording this. This is wonderful the way he does. All things are possible to the one who believes. And the man blurts out these words. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Doubt. He seems to be a very self-aware person who is truly trusting the Lord, but admits that there are things that just don't make sense. 
maybe little things, maybe giant things. But Lord, I believe, but please help my unbelief. Help me where I identify. I'm unsure. I don't understand. I'm tested and simply have to lose this in you because every time I think of it, I can't deal with it. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. A sign of the tension that we live in, every one of us to some degree, some more than others, in our Christian walk. As we transition to Thomas, the star of our doubting show today, we realize that Thomas is in a good crowd. Because you see, the ten to whom Jesus appeared Easter evening, uh, Thomas is gone, Judas is dead. And so the ten to whom Jesus appears Easter evening, they had been doubters too. After all, the women came back from the tomb and told the disciples, we saw an angel says he's risen, and they see this as idle talk. Mary Magdalene, having spent a little time talking with Jesus personally in the garden outside the tomb, comes back and says that they don't believe her either. So tell me about who's the doubters here. If Thomas is, so are all the rest of them. And friends, I think I'd be right in that group. I'd be and probably with most of you. Maybe some of you would have seen with the eyes of faith and believed just because someone else told you. But you see, I would have seen him die. I would have seen him extended and hanging on the cross. To me, the nails were too real and the blood was too true and his agony was too palpably felt. And when he bowed his head and breathed his last and gave his spirit up to God, I believe his death. But just because someone tells me they saw it, I'm not sure where I'd be in that crowd. I'm awfully glad to be born in this time when the witness of the church has been strong and the blessing of the Lord upon his church has been strong and we're so much that I may have had trouble with back in his day, I can stand on the shoulders of others and have stronger faith. Well, of course, that's the way it is, you see. But they all believed, and now Thomas hadn't seen the Lord. And the operative words that seem to deal with his unwillingness to believe are the only words that are supplied to us. Now, Thomas, one of the twelve, called the twin, was not with them when Jesus came. There are some who say Thomas should have stuck with them. What was he doing being a wall? And so Jesus came when he came because if Thomas was a wall, he still had disciples to see. And therefore, Thomas's hurt and doubt come from his disappointment with himself, they would say. Others say, no, as God is, Jesus came where and when he pleased. And some were there and one was not. But it doesn't mean he didn't like Thomas, but Thomas sure took it personally and says, unless I see, unless I place my finger, unless I place my hand, I will never believe. Well, Thomas has made a threat, hasn't he? He's made a threat. I'm not going to believe. If I don't see it, and not only is he making a threat, he's setting God's agenda of how God will deal with him. Lord, you will do this or I will not believe. He will appear to me. I will touch him. I will see it. I will touch it. I will touch it. And then I will believe. But unless then, I'm not believing. All right? And so I would say to you and to me, one thing we understand here is the lashing out when hurt. The lashing out when hurt. All of us at some time have said something to someone we probably had no business to say, and we said it in a flash of anger and in a quick uh, acuteness of hurt. But when we did it, it was still wrong. There are those who will seek to do that with God, and we generally say, don't do that. Even if those are your feelings, have enough wisdom after God has brought you under his word long enough not to bite the hand that's going to feed you. Have enough wisdom not to be the person in need of emergency spiritual attention, but here you are in the spiritual emergency room and you're being combative with a great physician. And so have enough wisdom not to have to go that route. But Thomas is hurt, and he's also in the middle of a unique world happening. Jesus' death for the sins of the world and his resurrection. And so Jesus does a wonderful, a beautiful thing for Thomas. He does let him wait for a week, but then he comes. And that next Sunday, when it says the eighth day, remember the Jews count all parts of days, so eight days means what we would call exactly a week later. So the next Sunday night, doors there still locked, and uh, 
Jesus comes and stands in the middle. This is his resurrection, powerful self. And there he is, and he's there for all of them. And the next thing he does is he intervenes for Thomas. He turns to him, he says, Thomas, put your finger here and see my hands. And do you see, and he goes on and, and fulfills everything Thomas said he had to do in order to believe. And here, God Almighty, victorious, having beaten sin and Satan, and having opened the doors to eternal life, bursting the bars that would keep us from there. God Almighty stoops to Thomas's agenda, nor does he have to, but he does, and starts out greeting Thomas and asking him to do exactly what he said he needed to do. And you can understand if I would tell you the books have been written on whether Thomas actually did put his hand there or whether Jesus coming to him and giving him that love that he so desperately and inclusion that he so desperately craved was enough. But whether he touched and went through all the evidentiary part as a part of worship by that time, he says to him, my Lord and my God. When Jesus intervened, it was all about his wounds. And you see, Jesus intervening with Thomas was all about the cross, wasn't it? It was all about the fact that that very way of dealing with God, of threatening and of setting the agenda for God, is something that Jesus took to the cross and nailed there and died for. For we, the creature, have no business acting that way. And so Jesus, it was about the cross, and he speaks of his wounds. And those wounds were for Thomas. And there that day in that room, Thomas knew more than in any other way that they were for him. And so he speaks, my Lord and my God. That's what Thomas experienced that day. But for us, the same is true. For us, when we get our lives into chaos, when we start finding ourselves barking out orders to God, when we start being discontent with his leading or his care. It is at those times that our Lord Jesus, by his Holy Spirit coming to us and by his personal presence as well, intervenes, intervenes on your behalf as he did for Thomas. I think by cataloging so many doubters in the scripture, we don't have to ask whether it's possible that we might be in that number. But we sure know that as surely as Jesus came for you, he came to intervene and change your life when you're in that bad place. He comes as a shepherd. I am the good shepherd. And he comes to you to intervene. And it's about the cross because the shepherd offered himself that the sheep may not be attacked by the wolf. He comes giving something called forgiveness. We read in our epistle that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses from all sin. And if you are home and you're reading this in your devotions, I hope you don't just read it as a task to get through it. I'd rather you read a few verses and meditated them on them and save the rest for another day. But if all you saw was those words, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin, you notice that word cleanses is in the present tense. It denotes a continual action. And the continual action of cleansing, the blood of Jesus Christ, friends, cleanses you. So you who are given baptismal grace, you who receive Jesus himself and his body and the blood of, of the cross at the altar as he intervenes in that way, that beautiful way. In every way, when he's intervening, it's always about the cross. It is for you and it involves his forgiving, restorative love. So it is that when he says, I am with you always, you can count on that baptismal promise. So it is that when we understand that he is praying for us, we read again, if you read these, you'll find he is. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He's advocating for you, how? On the basis of his cross. There's a child of mine. There is a child of yours, Father. There is one for whom I died. And no matter what the accuser says about you, no matter how terribly you portray yourself, it is Christ's advocacy and forgiveness from the cross which lifts you up. So you'll go forward this day. And as you go forward this day, 
you will go out and about into the world. You'll go out into your family. You'll go out among those who may not be your fans. But you will be praising God much as our psalm said, by being the you that God made you to be. His child by creation, his child by redemption. And you will also doubt. You will have questions. And you, as in a long line of believers, will doubt. But when you do, some of those will get you God's disapproval and he'll bring you back into shape as God the Holy Spirit reproves your heart and conscience. Others will be God's way of helping you know him more greatly and he will teach you from his word as you stay in the word each day. Other times the world will have seemed to have gotten the best of you and your body may be sick or ache and you'll be looking for reassurance, not that you've ever lost it, but just you could use some assurance as John in prison. Other times you'll just know yourself to be one who deals with belief and unbelief, but in the relationship, it's belief that defines it. So as you go forward, may God bless you and give you the knowledge that if Jesus would deal with tongues through the week, he will be intervening in your life and continuing to love you and to count you in, even when you thought you'd been counted out. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.